Praise God. Well, I know she said you could sit, but I'm going to have you stand again while we read the word. Can we do that? Can we all stand for the reading of the word? Tonight we're going to be in Job 38. And we're just going to read the whole thing. So, because it's just that awesome. We're going to try something a little bit different tonight. I got the media team back. You guys ready? Minister Elijah, you guys, thumbs up. We're good to go. All right. We're not going to put the words up there, but we're going to have some, we're going to have some pictures up there to kind of go with this. Everybody there? Job 38, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its, were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and I wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves will halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? that it might take the earth by its edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and the upraised arm is broken. Have you joined to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light, and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths of their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born, you have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of snow, or seen the storehouses of hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed? Or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cut a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to a water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and to make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from heavens? When the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, can you bind the chains of the palades? Can you loose Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with the flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who gives the ibis wisdom or who gives the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of heaven when the dust becomes hard? and the clods of earth stick together. Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, for it is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path. And Lord, I ask that you would come tonight, that your word would come alive in each one of us. Father, that you would just speak to us, God, change our lives tonight. Father, I submit this service to you and your sovereignty. I ask you to take control. That you would rule and reign in this place, Father. Let every word spoken tonight be from you, and not from me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It continues on in the next chapter and keeps going and going. God speaking to Job, telling him of the things he's done that we can't hardly comprehend. The title of my message tonight is Good Plans. Good Plans. I've been in construction for a long time, since I was 17. I'm 43 years old now, so you can do the math. And one of the critical parts of building something is having a good set of plans, right? If I have a complete set of plans, it makes it a whole lot easier for me to build a house, any kind of building. The plans are critical to it being done. And when a set of plans gets developed, you take a team of people, you take the owner, you take an architect, you take an, a structural engineer, a uh, plumbing engineer, electrical engineer, HVAC, and you take all these people, you sit them down, and they work together 
to put a set of drawings together, a set of plans together that can be delivered to the builder, and the builder then takes those plans and builds something with them. The more complete those plans are, the easier it is to build the building. But in all my years of construction, I've never once had a complete set of plans where everything worked together perfectly. It just doesn't happen. No matter how, how detailed they are, no matter how much time they spend together, there's always something that comes up in the building process that wasn't accounted for. Something that the structural engineer may have missed, or the architect, now the architect does the design, what it's supposed to look like, what the finishes are, what kind of carpet, what kind of tile, what kind of paint, and then the structural engineer has to figure out how they're gonna make it stand. And they have to work together, but something always gets missed. You know, for instance, if you had to put a bathroom on the second floor, well, there has to be some place for the water from that toilet to get down to the first floor and get out of the house. So your architect is going to put the bathroom up there. He puts it up there, and then the structural engineer puts a structural beam directly under the toilet, and you can't go through the structural beam. So you have to go back to the architect, and you have to write what's called an RFI. It's a request for information. And I submit that to him, and I say, okay, how is this going to work? You've got the bathroom above this beam that I can't drill through because it will compromise the structure. So the architect and the engineer will then go back, they'll sit down, they'll write a solution, they'll, they'll amend the plans, and they will give me a corrected set of plans that I build off of. Happens all the time. By the end of a project, depending on the scale and the scope of the building you're doing, you might have 100 RFIs. If it's a smaller one, you know, 10 to 15, but there's always something that's missed, right? No matter how much time they put into them. Our text shows somebody kind of questioning God's plans and methods, right? Somebody was questioning God. And God's response is, where were you when all this was happening, right? What, what do you know? There's a little bit of sarcasm in there. I don't know God, you know, you've been alive for so long. Did you guys catch that? You were, you were alive when I did this, right? You know everything. What happens when we when we try to figure out how God's doing stuff and we try to put our limited understanding on his plans, we, we interpret things in the wrong way. We need to come to an understanding that God's plans, they're complete. You don't need to do an RFI. There's no need for a request for information. He's got them figured out. But in our natural tendency, and myself especially because I am a builder, and it's what I do, and I look at things and I figure them out and I structure them in my brain, this is how this is going to work, this is how this is going to work, this is how this is tied together, I question things. And I put things together in my head. And sometimes when it comes to God's plan, it doesn't quite work out for me. Or I think I might see a better way of getting things done. And you start to deviate off of his plan. But we have to remember, God's plans are complete. Right? There's no need for an RFI. It's a perfect plan. We have limited understanding, but we serve a limitless God. There is no limit to God. He is all-knowing. He has all power. And he is everywhere all at once. He is a limitless God. There is no end to him or his knowledge. Us being a limited people tend to try to put limits on God just so we can comprehend him. Right? We try to put him in a box. We've all heard that, you know, don't put God in a box. But our brain can't comprehend eternity. Our, our brain can't comprehend things never ending. Right? There, it, it always stops someplace. Don't allow our limited understanding to be put on a limitless God and on God's plans for your life. Yeah. Like I said, unlike the plans I work with, when I see something that's not going to work, I question the architect. Don't question God. <laughs> right? Don't go to God and say, Lord, I don't think this is going to work. I always have suggestions for the architect. Right? You know, this would probably work better if you did it this way. And they'll listen. And we'll change things as we go. But when it comes to God's plan, we can't be manipulative like that. We have to allow him to be sovereign. We have to allow him to be God and to understand that he does know everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. So I've had, I've had plans that are like that big around, 100 pages, and you have to go through those and have an understanding of them. And you have to trust in the architect. I have to trust in my structural engineers that they have stuff figured out. It's the same way with God. So let's just look at some of the things that God has built. Okay, let's look at some of the creations he has. Let's start with the earth, right? On earth, our, our lovely home, there's over 7 billion people, 7.3 billion people. Now, even that number, can anybody really comprehend how many a billion is? It's just a massive number, but there's that many people running around on earth right now. 7.3 billion. 
Now, with that, he's a God of details. Right? There's not one detail missed. Humans share the planet with as many as 8.7 million different forms of life. Now, that's, you know, mammals, vertebrates, invertebrates, whatever. 8.7 million different forms of life. According to a noted Harvard biologist, there are over, now listen to this, 10 quintillion living insects. Now, quintillion is put 10, then put 18 zeros behind that. All right? That's like 10 billion billion living insects on the planet right now. They're everywhere. <laughs> Mathematicians have attempted to calculate estimates of the number of individual animals in a variety of groupings according to the data. The total number of individual animals on the earth adds up to approximately 20 quintillion, which is 20 billion billion, again, 20 with 18 zeros. That's how many life forms are on this planet. I mean, it blows your brain. We're just on earth right now, right? We're not getting past that yet. 20 quintillion. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but it's 20 billion billion. That's, it's massive. Matthew 10, 29, 31. It says, are, you, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You guys ever seen a flock of birds like that? Not one bird on this entire planet falls without the knowledge of God. Every single hair on your head is accounted for. So again, going back to God's plan, it's complete. There's no missing details. Every hair, Minister Chinta, every hair on your head is accounted for. So, now with that, 7.3 billion people on the planet, right? Every hair accounted for. On a normal person's hair, there's about 100,000 hairs. So if you just sit here and count, you get to about 100,000. Now, mine's not as thick as other people, so you're not going to get as many on there. But on average, there's 100,000 hairs on one person's head. God has every single one of them accounted for. Now multiply that by the 7.3 billion people on the planet. He's a God of details. Every single one is accounted for. That's over 7 trillion hairs. 7 trillion, Pastor Ann. Now, we have some pastors on the staff that are kind of making that curve a little bit lower, right? <laughs> I'm not going to name names, but I love you guys. It just blows me away thinking about the sheer magnitude of life on this planet that God has created. I mean, he, he, he spoke this place into existence. Just the sheer magnitude of life and the, and the attention to detail that he has. Now, we're going to go from our planet out. Okay, we're going we're to expand a little bit on his creation. This is what God has created. He's like the ultimate builder, right? I like building. He's built things that go beyond my, my understanding. Let's go to the solar system. So in our solar system, we just talked about what's on our planet, our one little planet. In our solar system, there's eight planets, unless you're going to ascribe to the thing where Pluto is not a planet anymore, but when I was in school, it was still a planet. So we're going to call it a planet. So in that, our solar system, a rotating or orbiting around our sun, are eight planets. We're just one of them, right? So nine planets, if you count Pluto, I'm sorry. If you don't count Pluto, it's eight. So our solar system, so far astronomers have found more than 500 solar systems. That's just what they've observed. And discovering new ones every year, given how many they have found in our own neighborhood of the Milky Way galaxy, scientists estimate that there may be tens of billions of solar systems, perhaps even as many as 100 billion solar systems. So all that life that's on Earth and everything accounted for down to every hair on every person's head across the entire planet, all accounted for. Then there's 100 billion of those. Okay, so now let's go to our galaxy. And in case you're getting lost, you're there. Okay, so you see where you're at? Right up there in the corner. Ed, you know your way around? <laughs> you're there. So this is our galaxy. And in our galaxy, it's full of solar systems. You know, it's, 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 it's massive. It's huge. Our galaxy is massive. Lots, lots of solar systems. They, they believe there's... Hold on a second. Between 100 billion and 200 billion galaxies. So 100 billion to 200 billion of those. Is your brain bro broke yet on trying to figure out all this stuff? It's massive. It's huge. 100 billion to 200 billion of those in the universe. 
So in the known universe, they don't know if there's more than one universe. I stopped there. Okay, so after this, I stopped. There, there's not really an answer. There's a lot of arguments that there's people that believe there's multiverses. There might be more than one universe. But just thinking there's 100 billion galaxies inside the universe. And this is all created by God. Now, let's come back to Earth. Just kind of condense it down again. So we're back down to where we live. Going back to the details that God has in his plans, like I said before, he's the ultimate builder. The earth, as you're sitting where you're sitting right now, we're rotating on our axis, right? And then as we're rotating on our axis, we're spinning, we're orbiting the sun. As we're rotating on our axis, you're actually moving about 1,000 miles an hour where you sit. As we orbit the sun, we're actually orbiting around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. So you're going 67,000 miles per hour right now. We just happen to be the right density, the right mass. We have to be going the right speed. We have the right rotation. All to make sure that we don't, one, escape the gravitational pull of the sun or get sucked into it. It's right where it has to be. The mass of the earth, the speed of the earth, the rotation of the earth all stops us from being sucked into the sun. Same thing with every other planet in our solar system. Same thing with every planet in the galaxy. Now with that... Our solar system is rotating around in the galaxy, and the galaxy is rotating around in the universe. I think he has the details figured out. Right? I don't, I don't think he's missed anything. Now, when I, when I build, and I have a set of plans, I have a rule. All my guys know, you don't deviate from the plans. You build it the way the plans say to build it. Now, the reason for that, while I'm building something, is because if I build something and I do it exactly according to plans and it fails, they're going to come in, they're going to investigate, and they're going to look to make sure that I did everything the way it was supposed to be done. I used the right amount of nails, I used the right hangers, I used the right size wood, the foundations were done properly, and when they find out that all that was done right, they go to the engineers and they go to the architect. I don't have a responsibility, so I make sure that I never ever deviate from the plans. I don't build it unless they've drawn it and they've corrected it and it comes back to me and then I'll build it. If there's a question, it goes to the architect, they redo it, they send it back to me, then I'll build it. You never deviate from the plans. We have to be that way in our walk with God. Yeah. No compromise. Come on, you ever. Yeah. No compromise. We have to build according to the plans. Now, with that, when I get my plans, we go back to the picture of the plans, Willie? When I get my plans, I have to take those plans, go home, plan it, say, ah, it's fine. <laughs> I don't remember what number it was. So I take those plans and I have to study them. I have to get to know every detail in those plans. I sit down page by page. I read everything that's written on them, every rule. I look at every detail, I go through every single page, I know the routing for the plumbing, I know the routing for the electrical, I know what size boards I have to get, I make an order based on those plans, I know where every piece of wood goes in that structure. I have to know those plans intimately because when we're building it, I have to know what comes next so critical pieces don't get missed. If you miss something structurally on a house, it could fall. I have to know those plans. God's given us his plans. Oh, come on. Do you know the plans that God has for you? Have you studied them? Do you know what he says about you? Do you know the details that he's laid out so painstakingly in your life? You have to get intimate with the plans of God. You have to know them inside and out. Because if you don't, something critical can get missed in your life. As you're building, something critical can be left out. And if that gets left out, the structure will fail, it'll collapse, and it causes death and pain. You have to know your plans. You have to know your plans. And so many times, I've seen so many carpenters do this. Oh, I know a better way. That's overkill. That's way too much. That beam doesn't need to be that big. We don't need that many nails. Come on, that's just overkill. And you pay the price later on. We can't be that way in our walk with God. When we... When we're doing something for God, when we're living our life for God, you get to know your plans. You get to know what he says about you. You get to know who he says you are. You get to know how he says to do things. Submit your life to that plan, and your structure will stand. Through anything. 
Come on, if he can figure out everything we talked about, I mean, the hair thing just messes me up. Every single hair, Pastor Ann, every hair. Get to know the plans God has for you. Get to know how he wants things done. How he wants you to do things in your life. And trust in him. If, if you can wrap your head, even partially, around everything he's created, and, and the attention to detail that he has, the sheer amount of life on this planet, how can you not trust him? But a lot of times, and this is, you know, in my life, I'll start seeing things just like Job and his friends. God, this isn't making sense. This, this isn't what I thought was going to happen. This isn't how it's supposed to be. I have to change something. Something's not right. God, this isn't what you spoke to me. God, this wasn't what the promise was. This isn't how it's supposed to be. There's not supposed to be pain. And you start deviating because you've lost trust in the builder. You've lost trust that God has it all figured out. See, it doesn't matter what your situation is, what you're going through. If you trust in God's sovereign plan, in his sovereign plan, you won't be wavered. But you have to know it, right? You have to know it because the enemy will come in and try to put in little deceitful things to get your head turned and have you start getting off, get you off plan, get you going in the wrong direction. And you don't know you're being deceived unless you know the plans. See, when I'm building something, I know what's coming next. Nobody can come in and tell me this is supposed to be, you know, a 12-inch beam when it's supposed to be a 24-inch beam. I know what it's supposed to be because I've studied them. But the enemy's going to come in and he's going to tell you, you don't need nothing that big. It doesn't need to be that big. Make it smaller. You know, if this room, you see how wide open this room is? The reason this room can be this wide open is because above this ceiling are structural members that can span this space. If they skimped on those, the ceiling would fall. And the enemy wants you to skimp on things in your life. He wants you to come and do less than what you're supposed to do and not follow God's plan. You have to know it so you can tell him he's a liar and build it right. What's God's plans for your finances? How many of us get off track when it comes to that? You know, does it make sense in the natural to give 10% of my money when I can't see that I can pay all my bills this month? And how easy is it with that to say, okay, well, I can't afford to pay tithes this month, so I'm not going to follow God's plan. And the enemy comes in and tells you to put a smaller beam in where you should have put a bigger one, and you don't follow God's word, and your finances collapse. Because you allow fear to come in because you don't trust God's plan. But again, you're not going to know what it is if you're not in the Word of God. Unless you study His Word, unless you get in His Word, you know it inside and out so you can beat the devil up with it when he comes to try to lie to you and say, if you pay your tithes, you can't pay your bills. No, liar, if I don't pay my tithes, then I'm not going to pay my bills. Because I'm here to tell you, every single time I've been faithful in my tithe, even when there's not enough money and it doesn't make sense in the natural. No, I serve a God who's made a billion, hundred billion galaxies. I think He's got my finances figured out. I think he knows the plan for my finances. So trust him. Find out what he says about your money. You know, it's not God's plan. It's not God's plan for the government to be taking care of everybody. That's not the plan in my Bible. My Bible has a scripture in Leviticus that says when you harvest your field, you leave the corners. And when they leave the corners and the people come in and they can glean off the corners and they get fed that way. Well, you know what? It's not getting handed to them. If you don't eat, you don't work. They had to come pick it themselves. See, God's plan for the hungry and the poor isn't the government, it's us. It's the church. Why is the structure falling apart when it comes to that? Because it's not God's plan. Why is it not working? Why is our debt going higher and higher and higher as a country? Why is over 50% of the population on some form of assistance? Because it's not God's plan. Why is it falling apart? Because they're not listening to what God has said. If the church would rise up, if we as the body of Christ would rise up and start paying our tithes, there wouldn't be any need. There wouldn't be any want. And if we would obey the word of God and not glean the corners, but make sure we leave enough for the poor and the needy, everything would be taken care of. In Acts, in Acts it said that nobody had a need because everybody brought and gave. 
everybody brought and gave. You know, see, if we follow God's plan, we won't continually struggle in all the things we struggle in. But what happens? You start thinking in your limited way of understanding. And you put your limitations on a limitless God. And you rob yourself of a blessing. You rob yourself of God's plan in your life. Nobody's taking it from you. You're giving it away. You're letting yourself be robbed. So find out what God's plan is for your finances. And stick to it. Just stick to the plan. Don't deviate. Don't build it any other way. You build what's on the plan. You do exactly what God said to do. And your finances will be blessed. I'm not saying anybody's not going to come in every month and try to tell you to do the same thing over and over again. Well, you don't have enough to pay. No, I do. We're just going to do it. Follow God's plan. Here's one for you. How about relationships? What's God's plan for your relationships? You know, if every husband would love his wife like Christ loved the church, there'd be no divorce. There wouldn't. You know, if, if, if husbands and wives would do what the word says, and the wives would submit to the husbands, the husbands would honor their wives, and the husbands would love their wives like Christ loved the church, there would be no divorce. But what do we do? Well, Lord, I'll start loving her like you love the church as soon as you start submitting to me. And then the women say, well, I'll start submitting to him as soon as he becomes a man of God. And he starts to love me like Christ loved the church. And nobody ever does what's supposed to be done because we're not following God's plan. And what happens? The structure falls apart. It collapses. And there's families inside. And children get crushed. If we would stick to God's plan, if we would just stick to his plan, he's got it all figured out. And it's not really hard. For some reason, we make it hard. For, for some reason, we make trusting a limitless God hard because we allow the enemy and even our own selves to talk us out of his promises. Husbands, I want to challenge you. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. You know what that means? You know what that means? It means, okay, I've got a magic drawer at my house. I've got this magic underwear drawer. It's awesome. I come home from work. I go upstairs. I got to take a shower. I open up that drawer, and there's a clean pair of underwear, a whole stack of them in that drawer. I take that out. I go shower, you know, throw everything in the laundry. I come back the next day. I open that drawer, and guess what? It's still got underwear in it. 20 years. It's a magic drawer. It's never been empty because my wife yeah. takes care of my stuff. Now, do I... What if, my, what if my magic underwear drawer got broken and it wasn't working anymore? Do I sit back and say, well, I don't love you no more. I only love you because of the drawer. That's not how Christ loved the church. Man, again, I'm challenging you. Christ loved me in the midst of my sin. He loved me in the midst of my debauchery when I was at the lowest of the low, when I was at the worst of the worst. He loved me anyways, and he went to the cross. He went to the cross and died for my sins. Not because I was doing things for him, but when I was doing things against him. And if we'll rise up as men of God and love our wives no matter what. You see, there was a point in our, in our relationship where things weren't as good as they are now. We weren't serving God. We got saved, and, you know, it was still rocky. And one day God hit me, and he gave me a revelation. And he basically told me, you know, it's a choice to love your wife. I chose to love you. It's a choice for you to love your wife. And I went to my wife and I told her, I said, you know what? There's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. That's not within your power. You can't do anything to make me stop loving you because my love for you is unconditional. It doesn't matter if that drawer is broken or not. If dinner's on the table when I come home, it don't matter. She can't make me stop loving her. Nobody can. She doesn't have to earn it. It's just there. And I'm telling you what, our relationship changed. My wife finally believed that I loved her. If we follow God's plan, men, follow God's plan. You know what? It's time to step it up as men of God and to be the men that God's called us to be. Quit sitting back, making the women take care of everything, but we need to rise up and be the men of God he's called us to be. Not broken, not weak, meek, not weak. If we follow God's plan, can you imagine what this church would be like? Pastor Ann, if we stepped up, if we stepped up, what would this place be like? Right away. Who's my worship team tonight? 
Thank you, Willie. My last point. We have to submit to his plan. He's not going to make you do it. He's not going to come beat you over the head and say, this is how you're going to do it. We have to submit to the sovereignty of God in our lives. And you know what? It's not really that hard. Think about all that stuff. You put the picture of the galaxy back up there, Minister Elijah. Think about everything he's created. The, the details he's put into everything. He knows every hair, not just on your head, but on the 7.3 million people on this planet. It's not hard to submit to somebody who's got it all figured out. So submit your lives to his plan. Get in your word. Know what his plans for your life are. Line your life up with it. Don't let the enemy come in and steal what God's already died to give you. You know, he sent his son. His son died on the cross so that we can be reconciled with him. So that we can now be joint heirs with Christ. I'm the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God. You're the righteousness of God through Christ. We're joint heirs with him. We've been grafted into the kingdom. We're a royal priesthood. Who are you? What's God's plan for you? Do you know his plan? Can you submit to it? Do you trust him? Like I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of times in my life where things will start getting rocky and I'll start questioning God's plan. That's not being submitted. That's being rebellious. Amen? We need to submit to God's plan in our lives. He's got a great plan for every single one of you. There's something ha God has for each and every single one of us to do. And it's not small. You know, he's not a small God. A hundred to two hundred billion of those. Where are you in God's plan in your life? Are you following it? Or maybe you've deviated a little bit. You know, the, the Bible says to kind of search your heart. And I want to do that tonight. If we could all stand.